the first thing we got to do is I get an organized, you can tell I haven't done this in a month, is we've got to appreciate those that allow us to have these free sessions for members and non-members alike. But of course, if you're not a member, what a great time to join the chamber, right? So let's have uh, Independent Bank, our sponsor, and we've got an old buddy of mine, my buddy, Jeff Kimbrough. Hey, Jeff, how you doing, buddy? Hey, Brian, good afternoon. Good to see you, man. It's been, it has been a while. Um, thanks again for having me on. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Kimbrough with Independent Bank. Um, as title sponsor, we are always grateful uh, to have you all join us. Um, one thing I love about this organization is our ability to serve our clients. Um, during this pandemic, um, what we've done is has focused on our current relationships to make those make those stronger. Um, and as we, we continue to find innovative ways to be that resource for our clients, mainly so they can have someone to depend on. Um, in other words, we're striving to be heroic. So when I say heroic, two things come to mind. Responsibility and share community. These are two things that we care about. And these are definitely two things that can help us serve our clients heroically. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but, and with so much on today's agenda, um, I really just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have, if there's anything that we can do at Independent Bank to serve you, to be a resource for you, for you, your business, your employees, let's connect. Um, give us opportunities to be to be that opportunity to serve you heroically. Um, so with that being said, thank you guys. Hope you have a wonderful day and continue to be safe. Okay, thanks a lot, Jeff. I really appreciate it. And if uh, our illustrious president and CEO, Beverly Robertson, can unmute herself and share her screen really quickly. Beverly, I think that one, the chamber leadership, and I was a part of this decision, I'm pretty proud of myself right now, that we got you on board to run our chamber, right? And there's been so many crazy things happening in the entire world right now. It's been great to have you at your helm. And then you went and tried to double down on the efforts. And I'd love for you to introduce your, what I'll say, a great victory uh, that, that you have caused for our, our business community. Go ahead. Thank you, Brian. It's good to see you again. Um, I have the plum pleasing privilege of introducing Ted Townsend, our, our keynoter for today. Now, you need to know that Ted has amassed 15 plus years, uh, heck, it seems like 20, uh, in economic development because of the strength of his accomplishments. He joined the University of Memphis uh, in 2018 as the first ever Chief Economic Development and Government Relations Officer of the university and served on the President's Council. He then led the university's economic development activities in Memphis and Jackson, Tennessee, and oversaw the university's Cruise Center for Entrepreneurship, the university's Neighborhood Development Corporation, and the University of Memphis's Research Foundation, as well as government relations and the policy division. Ted previously served as deputy commissioner and chief operating officer of the Tennessee Department of economic and community development where he oversaw the department's day-to-day -day affairs. During his seven years there, the state announced over 1,100 projects, 1,100 projects committing 155,000 new jobs backed by over 32 billion in private sector capital investment. Ted Townsend fiercely advocates for us at the local, state, and national levels for new investment. He believes in the assets of the marketplace and articulately and passionately sells them to others and is committed to positioning this city as a region, uh, as an important region and a great place in which to invest and grow. Uh, and I have to tell you, I call him TNT because he's creating an explosion. <laughs> in economic development in Memphis, Tennessee. And I know Brian wants to say a few things maybe, but I see Ted is on here. So ladies and gentlemen, I give it now to my TNT at the chamber, Ted Townsend. Thank you, Madam President. I am uh, thrilled to be able to join uh, the Small Business Council today. This is uh, something I've been looking forward to since the invitation came my way. And Brian, thank you for organizing it. 
Uh, Jeff, thank you for sponsoring it and all that you do uh, with the, the banking community here and supporting small businesses and their growth. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just uh, establish the story. Why am I in this role? And you heard from the, the bio a little bit about what uh, brought me to this moment, but truly I've been working toward this and building toward this moment in my career for the last 15 years. Um, from my private sector experience, I know what it means to create a business here in Memphis and to take Memphis innovations and position them for success. When I founded uh, Argentus Pharmaceuticals, a small biopharmaceutical company in uh, 2005, um, I transitioned from there into the public sector. And, and from that experience, I know what it means to assist businesses to expand and reinvest in Memphis. Uh, I started out as the first regional director under then Governor Haslam's uh, Department of Economic and Community Development. And what I learned uh, very quickly was that uh, the, the work that we do here in market is so critical to support businesses and creating that business climate so that you all can succeed. Um, but as regional director, I was a part of the team that worked on what was called Project Tiger. And, and that represented the retention of International Papers corporate headquarters here. Uh, that was baptism by fire, let me tell you, but it was a thrill to work that and I saw how critical this work can be to the Memphis economy. Can you imagine what it would have been if IP had left us? Um, I worked with uh, the chamber chairman, Willie Gregory on Nike's expansion, which now represents their largest logistics facility in the Americas and really truly fortifying the North Memphis and, and Fraser communities by their presence there. All of that work as regional director was recognized by uh, then uh, Commissioner Bill Haggerty and, and Governor Haslam. And I was uh, provided the privilege and opportunity to be promoted to assistant commissioner of strategy with the department. And why that was really important is it, it truly gave me a holistic view of what economic development means for the state uh, from an operations standpoint. Within strategy, I had the business enterprise resource office, which focused on creating a, a suite of services for small businesses statewide. We launched the, the quick uh, start guide and the web portal uh, that hopefully allows for a more expedited process for business formation in our state. Look, what we realized and, and what you saw from that is, you know, Tennessee is home. Uh, to the most small business growth of any state in the nation. I think two, two years uh, uh, in the last three or five. Um, that is because of the intentionality that was put forward there. Uh, most net new jobs are created from firms that are from zero to five years old. Uh, existing firms, yes, they do create jobs, but, but there's more automation and elimination of, of jobs than there are in the, the very dynamic uh, sometimes disruptive nature of new businesses that are forming. So we, I was excited to be a part of that. I also oversaw the innovation platform, which really was the conduit to launch Tennessee, which supported the full ecosystem of entrepreneurial efforts across the state. Uh, so I was, I was thrilled to do that, but I also was part of the team getting back to uh, the, the Memphis centric uh, aspect of this. Um, you know, something that most folks uh, believe and thought, and I heard it even this morning, they said, well, we thought we lost you to Middle Tennessee. You actually never did. I commuted to Nashville for five years, Monday through Friday. It was important for me to remain a Memphian and to turn heads from Nashville West to understand the importance and the critical nature of, of Memphis to the overall state's economy and the nation. Um, but I was part of a team that, that worked on adjusting the aviation fuel tax uh, to create a more competitive business environment for air carriers to include one that you may know that calls Memphis home, FedEx, uh, where you've seen their significant investment in their global hub and, and modernizing it and expanding it. I also worked with the uh, then Service Master executive team on their exploration, relocating their business operations and helped craft the incentive package that ultimately went into the reinvestment of Peabody Place as their corporate headquarters. Uh, finally, I worked with uh, Governor Haslam's office and the Tennessee General Assembly on securing the approval of a multi-year capital infrastructure grant that would allow for St. Jude's expansion, which has represented billions in, in capital investment and thousands of new jobs to our community. So ultimately, during my tenure at the state, I was involved in so many economic development success stories that fortified Memphis's economy and played a part in Tennessee being recognized as state of the year 
and economic development back to back years. That's really difficult to do, but it's like winning national championships back to back years. I expect that for the greater Memphis Chamber. We're going to be the top economic development organization in the country, and we're going to re be recognized for it because of the results that we can bring forward here. Um, I know what it means to promote an impeccable brand nationally and internationally. Tennessee is so well respected due to the leadership that you've seen over multiple administrations backed by a legislature that understands the importance of economic development. It's a full contact sport. It takes all of us. And, and today I'm hoping that we have a back and forth and a dialogue, but I expect a call to action and a call to arms so that every business owner or, or stakeholder that's a part of, of this lunch in the know understands the mission of the Greater Memphis Chamber, buys into it and becomes a part of the success of that. Every organization will benefit by growing the metrics here. And, and those are, those are going to be um, highlighted later, but Memphis truly is a shining star it, it, in that brand awareness. Um, and it's my intention to tether the strengths of this community together with all of our stakeholder partners and generate this pipeline of corporate prospects that are seeking either an expansion or a relocation of their operations to make Memphis home. You know, something that, um, that I have uh, been a part of in meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, particularly with site selection consultants, where they're asking us, why Memphis? Why Memphis? And the answer to that is really another question. Why not Memphis? And I emphasize, why not Memphis? The time is now. And we are in, in a, an incredibly unique position to provide a sophisticated and welcoming community that affords them significant competitive advantages like no other place on the planet right now. Many of you that are here understand what it means uh, and the advantages that are here as a business operator and owner in, in the Memphis community. Uh, I've seen Memphis just uh, recently not shrink from the macro global forces at play right now, but to face things soberly, shouldering in on the challenges with a thoughtful an intentional uh, plan of, of strategies at place. Um, I compliment our, our leader, fearless leader, Beverly Robertson, um, and where she has galvanized the effort to uh, take the, the, the protests that have occurred here and listen and create pathways to progress from learning what, what is needed in our community. Um, other markets have not gotten that right and they are still struggling with it. And I'm so proud of the efforts that the Greater Memphis Chamber has marshaled to make sure that we are listening and we are getting it right and we're creating that business climate that is inclusive, that is focused on a shared prosperity that is, that is enjoyed by all of our citizenry. That's what the Greater Memphis Chamber does and it's focus on the full business continuum. There is no space in my belief that that a door is closed based on the size of the business. We have deliverables and a commitment to service, no matter who you are, what business you operate, you're contributing to the overall economy, whether it's a lifestyle business or a Fortune 500, Fortune 100 corporation. We are here to serve you all. And I think that we have the team in place uh, to be able to, to realize a future that's based on resiliency, uh, make no mistake, we are uh, in the midst of, of the headwinds of a pandemic and an economic crisis and, and uh, uh, racial inequalities and, and the lack of social justice nationwide. We have to face all of that head on. I believe we're equipped to do that very thing. So, um, so I'm excited about this. And a lot of people then say, well, what's next? Where are you taking us? And, and I have said it many times. If you've heard it, I apologize. But there, there are high expectations. I come with a sense of urgency. I expect results. Um, I have to manage expectations even for myself, but we are focused on getting new business here and, and new uh, other existing businesses to double down their investment in Memphis and expanding. Um, pressure is a privilege. And that's what I've said many times. And I understand that, but it's a privilege to be in this role uh, and to be a part of the team that's going to, I believe, usher in uh, a new dawn of, of discovery uh, for other companies in the U.S. and companies uh, internationally 
to understand the importance of Memphis and how they can benefit and strengthen their business models by being here. Uh, so we're going to build the team. We're going to build the resources and the narrative uh, to be very aggressive and proactive in, in curating this pipeline of really attractive businesses uh, that we want here, that we want them to call home. Uh, we're going to fill that pipeline. We're going to do it based on a sector strategy uh, from the mass economics uh, uh, clusters uh, report where you saw ag tech uh, and food tech is, is certainly an area of strength. Uh, business is a business. Uh, we're going to focus on that emerging and applied technologies, medical devices, of course, music um, is, is one that I am so excited about and one that I think we have just not tapped the full potential of owning that. Um, and transportation, distribution, and logistics, of course. Uh, I've had success uh, recently at the U of M. Uh, as Beverly mentioned, we, we launched the research park. Uh, we've had success in, in uh, locating Green Mountain Technology and a couple of their high analytics teams uh, there at the park. Sweet Bio, we brought back home. And, uh, and, and they've had tremendous success and Kayla Graff, their CEO has just been recognized nationally as a, a small business uh, a leader. And um, DevCon, we relocated them, their headquarters from Atlanta to the park. Uh, Prospero started out as a startup in our, our park and uh, then quickly expanded and took up space in, in uh, One Commerce Square. And we're so excited about their trajectory. Uh, so we're, we're really focused on the mission at hand and, and making sure that, um, that we weaponize the narrative, uh, that we are uh, audacious uh, in our expectations of people to understand that Memphis is the place to be. So with that, I will pause and hand things back over to Brian. I understand there are some questions. Well, I think that, Ted, I really appreciate you framing everything. And I the lesson here for people that didn't know you is Beverly and her team landed a pro, a whale, and you could have pretty much done anything. And we're really thankful to have you here. And I know that there was a lot of arm twisting and begging. And so really thank you for coming on board and, and Beverly's team really landed it. So I was really excited about this and, and glad that we're here. So, okay, so let's get, let's get to work. I'm going to fire a series of questions at you, but I want to frame a little bit about where my heart lies, and I know where a lot of Memphians' hearts lies, is we want to beat Nashville. Now, I'm not suggesting that we want Nashville not to do good. We want them to do just dandy. We still want to beat them. And the issue since 2000, Ted, has been the GDP of Memphis has risen about 9%. About 9%. Nationally, it's 40%. That's a lot more than us. Nashville's been about 75. And so your mission that you've chosen to accept is, is, is really monumental. And the other issue that we're facing is the prosperity of the entire region is really tough. So the reason why we're also fixated on jobs, economic growth, because it increases our prosperity, just so everyone's on board and Ted knows this. So mm -hmm. um, the first question, Ted, and I, we'll see how many we can get to here is, is your first concern, and I don't think people realize that we could lose FedEx. I mean, I never take it for granted. We shouldn't take FedEx for granted. We shouldn't take IP for granted. We should take AutoZone for granted. Is the main focus with the limited number of hours you have trying to grow existing companies at some level or trying to recruit new ones? Where, where's the focus going to be for the next you know, year or 18 months? Well, yeah, Brian, thanks for that question. I, I think it's, it's one that uh, I, I've seen uh, economic development organizations face all the time. And, and we did at the state level. I remember Governor Haslam uh, making a comment and said, you know, the one call I dread is from Mr. Fred Smith, who says, I'm thinking about leaving Memphis and, and Tennessee. Um, so it's always on our minds. And there's an awareness and a, and a sense of urgency to make sure that we do everything we can to help the businesses that uh, that have called our, our city home. Um, that's critically important. Y you have to focus on that uh, because existing business growth is a lot easier to get. Um, it, is, it is at a lower cost point, uh, quite frankly, from a human capital and resource perspective. Uh, so it makes sense to, to focus on in always enhancing that environment so that they can continue to double down their investment in who we are as a community and, and provide more and more opportunities to Memphians. 
Um, you know, that was part of the process with the, the aviation uh, uh, tax um, uh, refinement because it was important. We knew it was important to FedEx. They had other options in other states that had a much lower tax profile, uh, including Indiana, you know, who was moving an interstate uh, for FedEx to hopefully entice them there. Uh, North Carolina, many other uh, markets were, were competitive in that nature and, and Tennessee simply wasn't. So you have to do that, but you also always have to be fully armed and focused on next. What's next? How do we diversify our economy? And that's why I think the cluster strategy is really important. We have a lot of inherent strengths there that we can, can optimize. But it's, it's truly balanced. I just, I come equipped understanding what that balance is and, and how to manage it through well, the well, process. Ted, let's, I want to get to the, the new business strategy in a minute. We've got a mm -hmm. couple of questions on that. Well, let's stay with existing companies. And this is you a bet. very action-oriented group you've got here, right? I mean, you've got a mm -hmm. lot of participants that if you say we need better incentives, better pilots, we need to have more awareness of our, I mean, what are the things we need to be do you need more tools? Do you need more state legislation? What are the things you need to try to keep and grow current businesses? Yeah, I, I think we need everyone to fully, fully embrace and adopt the fact that economic development occurs every day, not just from the Greater Memphis Chamber, but in fact, it needs to be a part of, of the ethos of this business community. Um, we have to have everyone oriented to making sure that Memphis is fully armed and ready to compete globally. Uh, I wanna beat the pants off of Nashville, just like you do, Brian. But I also wanna beat the pants off of Orlando and Phoenix and other markets that are getting recognized for their economic development efforts. And it's, it's not a standalone opportunity. Um, we're gonna take a look at everything. Everything is on the table from our request for information process to our one-stop shop, to our site visits, to our marketing collateral, everything is being scrutinized to make sure that we are fully equipped. Now, in terms of incentives, those are always important. I think there's always room uh, for advancement there. It is an arms race. Uh, you have those who say, you know, we, we shouldn't be giving, you know, tax benefits to corporations. Um, but I, I just have the experience at, at ECD that you have the full suite of services, no matter the, the business size, but you have to incentivize growth. You have to reward that. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at it all. I, you know, we don't, I don't have a laundry list of things that we have to tick off. I think Memphis has a, an amazing existing portfolio of, of services and strengths that we can market right now. Uh, we'll refine those and add add to as necessary, but um, I'm excited where we are. So, so Ted, I know that we're you know we're very aware of our big big corporations and trying to do what they can mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. stay here. But then you've got a lot of mid sized companies that could pick up ship. They could they could move uh, further south sure. or some other city. Is I, I get really concerned, Ted, about companies that we just don't know that could pick up and lead. And so we're not having conversations mm -hmm. with all of them. Is there anything that the, the, the participants of this, if they hear about something, should they contact you? Oh my gosh, such and such company Absolutely. needs some incentives or something. How, how does that, what, like what's sure. the process? Just who do they pick up the phone? What do they do? Well, we, we've got, yes, uh, to answer your question directly, if you do hear of that, we, we need to know. If it's you and you need something, this chamber needs to know. Um, but you know we've we've already got a team that is focused on outreach and serving our our members and investors uh, in in what we do on a daily basis, and it's that communication that channel of information share that is absolutely critical. Um, I, I know at the the state level again, you know we had uh, these regional offices and and we set metrics on the number of existing business interactions that that we had per month, and. And I can't tell you how many times a project, you know, a new job creation and capital investment was realized because of that consultancy and that, that, um, that service leadership uh, that was offered to them. Uh, it's just, a lot of times it's just a matter of sitting down and understanding what the pain points and opportunities are for that business and making the ask, how can we help? How can we contribute to creating that business climate that will allow you to expand? Yeah, Ted, I mean, I think that that's it. 
it's fascinating. I think a lot of us know to use the chamber and utilize the resources. And I think there's so many more companies that don't realize that the chamber can help with that. So I loved your point about if you are having some issues, call your chamber representative, let's get in the pipeline. Let's start discussing how we can keep you and grow you and help you. And there's a lot more tools that the chamber offers. And I think a lot of people know. So let's I know you're focused on that. I, I, that that's a that's a big stress point. I love your 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 team members are going to have you know touch points and and some mm-hmm. you know clear deliverables there. So let's turn to new businesses. And over the years, I heard a mayor. This is a past mayor that said we don't really have an, a, a a fishing um, plan. What we do is if the fish jumps in the boat, we'll try to keep it right. And that's that's really tough. But I know that a lot of people are really busy out there. So you talked a little bit about you know, clusters. And we have a question here that, that came and says, um, what industries does your team typically target? Are you going to do tech, software form, firm, firms? Uh, or I've also heard the strategy of, boy, we should go to every company that does major work with FedEx and get them to put an HQ here. So, you know, what you mentioned some of the sectors, but is there some initial things you're going after right now? Like, what's the secret? Yeah. So, um, we absolutely are using data to inform our strategies and, and where we go. I think you, you have to immediately play off of the inherent strengths of this market. Um, transportation, distribution, logistics being one of those, medical device obviously being one of those. Uh, but, you know, honestly, there is no reason why we can't expect to be the ag tech capital of the world or the fintech capital of the world uh, or the esports capital of the world. Uh, you know, I am interested in identifying companies that are struggling in the markets that they're in. And, and those barriers are, are prohibiting their, their growth plans. Uh, we have tech companies in California uh, that I'm already engaged with uh, that are looking at things a different way in, in the face of COVID. Um, and they want to diversify their em- employee base. They want to distribute their workforce in a, in a new way. Heck, you even saw Pinterest who spent, what, 90, 85, $90 million to break their, their lease on their headquarters because the, the the environment is different now. And we have, I think, a very differentiated, compelling message to offer those businesses that may be struggling. Uh, and, and so we're going to focus on these sectors uh, that provide advanced opportunities for our citizens, because getting back to your point, we have to focus on those long term metrics that are translatable to the quality of life to providing hope to all of our citizens. If we look at the per capita per income and the, the GDP per capita, those are, are really important metrics for Memphis to focus on so that we can not only recapture what we lost, both from the 2008 recession and the current uh, crises that we're facing, but then have this solid platform to launch from to see tremendous growth like a Nashville has. Uh, That's all done through attracting businesses that are paying really great wages and we have the workforce to fulfill those. So so Ted, I know that you're, I mean, look, you're still getting your feet wet. You're going to let the data direct your attention for these different sectors. And, you know, is it the music industry, is it the film industry, but you're going to let the data, as long as they're decently paying jobs, right? So I I kind of get that. I do want to talk about two buckets really quickly. And I, Amy Daniels always likes me to start with the positive, but I'm going to start with the, with the hard stuff and we'll end on the more positive notes. All right. Sure. So sure. let's talk about barriers to bringing mm-hmm. and keeping companies here. Look, I know we've got a ton to offer. Like that's why we're never going to move. I love Memphis. I came here after law school. I'm a, I'm a big fan, Amy. We're going to be very positive. This is exciting times, but what are some of the barriers that we can start to deal with? And let's kind of, let's talk about sites. Let's talk about, Mm -hmm. do we have enough class A office space, enough warehouses? Do we need to build more? Or is it just an education that we are a lot more awesome than every other community on the face of the planet? Like what, what are the barriers that we need to kind of start working on with you to bring more jobs? Yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, You know, honestly, 
right away, we have to figure out how we can position Memphis as a region to compete. Uh, if you look at the, the other markets that have been successful, uh, Phoenix and Nashville, uh, to name a few, they have multiple communities uh, that, that really make up the, the whole economic development apparatus. Um, we, we have that. I, I had the fortune of working with our municipal chambers um, from the state level and uh, I've already met with them as well as the, the economic development entities within the municipalities uh, of Shelby County. It's going to take all of us. We have to have the, the full uh, portfolio of sites, whether they're greenfields, brownfields, office buildings, distribution centers, all of that. We have to have that uh, fully aligned and available, updated and available for the consumer to consider. You know, at the end of the day, these projects are highly uh, complex financial transactions. And in many cases, Memphis is, is being eliminated because of the perceived barriers that we don't have enough inventory, we don't have enough workforce. I'm going to absolutely flip that because I, I, I am offended by the fact that some of us think that we aren't producing enough and we don't have enough to offer. We do. It's just a matter, we're not telling our story effectively. We haven't in my assessment. And so we're, we're going to start to control that story, go directly to these businesses. Yes, we'll work traditionally with the site selection consultants and, and the other partners that source these projects. But I'm, I'm of the mind that if we get that dialogue going with the business on the front end, we can tell them, look, the University of Memphis, for instance, is producing at its highest record graduating levels ever. And here are the reasons why. And, and building that confident, confidence in the workforce, for one example, is, is something that I'm, I'm not sure others do. And if you don't tell that story, you don't fill that space, the other competitors will fill it for you and define it for you. You know, Ted, you so brought up- Working regionally, communicating and, and putting it all out there. Yeah, you made two really interesting points that I, I jotted down is, and I'm gonna take the second one or the first one second, mm -hmm. which is the team, one team, one united community. But first, just to frame for people that may not know, these site selectors you mentioned, so a company, it's my understanding, correct me, they'll hire a person or they'll have an internal team member that'll be like, we want to open up a headquarters. We want to open up a new warehouse. We want to find new class A office space, whatever. And they will start to search for communities that fit their bill. Whichever yeah. community is selling them on their community may bag it, right? So these site selectors mm -hmm. are attend to the person connecting the company with the community. And that's who you're talking about advocating with. Is that is that yes. right? That is correct. Uh, that is one community that is uh, sourcing these projects and, and working with businesses uh, to make sure that they identify the right market to either expand to or, or completely relocate. And, and that can be, you know, a, a portion of their business operations or the full HQ. Um, so uh, yes, that's one, I, you know, one other uh, that we're looking to begin to curate is the private equity community. Um, you know, these investments, they're, they're picking up uh, a lot of, uh, uh, businesses and markets and, and Memphis is, is not immune to that. Uh, we've had several businesses uh, who have been acquired by private equity firms. Uh, that's a source of, of uh, relationships that we can form uh, so that we can say, look, you know, if you want to see the, the best return on that investment and, and you're in the medical device space, you just acquired this company in X market, here's what Memphis has to offer. And, and so it's just having a different conversation that than people have ever expected before. So um, there are a lot of audiences, you know, direct to company, the site selection consultant community, uh, the accounting firms that handle a lot of this, like Deloitte and, and uh, Ernst and & Young. Um, and, and uh, you know, yes, these uh, private equity firms too. Okay, good. So I, that's some new knowledge for me. The private equity firm is great. That's why we've got you here to start thinking about all those different people you need to connect with. The, the other thing that jumped out at me was this, it's one community, it's one region. And um, I pulled some data up. This was a 2018 study on affluency ranking in the United States based on 
like household income and things like that. So our richest mm-hmm. suburban community, which, you know, the suburban communities are, are they can pull up the rest of the community, um, is Germantown. And they're ranked 607 on the U.S. Business World Report. 607. Mm-hmm. Nashville, I'm not obsessed with Nashville. I just want to win, Ted. Nashville's Bell Mead is ranked number 25. And so for people in the region to understand that, that prosperity radiates out to everyone in the community and can rise all ships is important. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Bellmead's 25 and Germantown 607. I'd love to get our yeah. entire community up. So I'm glad that you're focused on the global community. Um, mm-hmm. As far as hard sites, you, you mentioned, do we need to be thinking about, do you build the class A office space or do you wait for the, the site selector to say, we want to build that here? I mean, how does that, is that something we need to worry about right now? Do we have enough assets like hard, tangible, you know, sites and land and warehouses available? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we can do more development there for sure. Uh, we, we certainly have the opportunity to, uh, to see more development, particularly along the 385 corridor. Uh, which uh, I think if you activate those, they become as competitive as any uh, site in the country, uh, to be quite honest. So, um, but I think we, we have existing sites that, that uh, we can market. We need more. We always need more inventory. Uh, in terms of, of um, Class A, we, we already have capacity. We know that. Um, in fact, I've, I've toured uh, some just recently uh, to get a sense of what is possible and what's available. Uh, so we have some really compelling uh, inventory to offer in, in these prospects. Um, but I'm also excited about uh, marketing a project like the Walk at Union, uh, where we, we know what, uh, what uh, prospective Class A office space is going to enter the U.S. market based on an, a, you know, a, a realistic existing timeline of, of those buildings coming up and, and being open and available uh, for folks to, to see their logo and to own the Memphis skyline in ways that, that hasn't been uh, possible before. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, we have inventory. We're gonna market that very effectively, but I think there also always has to be that tension and, and provocation to, to building out more sites uh, so that we well, can stay I- in the game. I, I really do wonder a lot about the sites and the location, the office space. I mm-hmm. am one of those business geniuses that rented more office space in January. And then yeah. everybody started working from home, <laughs> you know? So we had all this extra unused space on, on, on this floor here, which was kind of like, well, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, we're thankful to still be in business after all this. Sure. Um, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, um, but oh, maybe no, I do. Do that. it's right. Over, it's right. I, over I want you to pull it out for a minute. Is, is there going to be, do you think like changes to the way workforce happens and do we need to start planning for sure. that and get kind of get ahead yeah. of it? What do, you, what do you think about it? No, that? we, we, we absolutely have to plan for that. We, we have to be adaptive. What I really would love is that, that Memphis gets aggressive on uh, developing a, a very innovative model uh, that is addressing the, the, um, I guess the the adaptation that is is going to have to be necessary in the wake of COVID. Um, And I'd love to see a post COVID world that we can realize. Um, But I think we all understand that it's likely going to be vastly different. We'll have uh, some familiarity with what we knew, um, but I think there's a great opportunity to be innovative right now. And if we can create a model that we incorporate into our, our messaging and marketing um, and get out ahead of other markets that are struggling with the same thing. If you think about it, it's pretty much a level playing field. How often does that exist? So it's a matter of how we respond to it now. And it's a special time and place to be able to do that and to say, here's what we've done. Here's what we can offer you. There is flexibility in, in our lease structure now. And here are the reasons why. We're building communities out so that we have uh, the most technological advances available so that you can work from home. And then you combine that with the full wrapper of what Memphis means from a livability perspective. It's, it's something that I, I think we have the ability to do. We just have to have the thought leaders 
And, uh, you know, let's, let's deputize everybody here on this Lunch in the Know to be a part of that process to help with the ideation and creating that national model that says, okay, wow, this is what Memphis did. This is how they recovered. They actually not only recovered from the pandemic and the economic crisis and the, this, you know, the social unrest, but they accelerated their pace because they were innovative and first in space, if you will. Well, and, and you know, luckily there's something in the water here in Memphis, Holiday Inn, FedEx, you get all these great companies that we're maybe, maybe we'll be, you know, open to how to restructure the work environment here too. I, we're going to go a couple minutes longer than we normally do, Ted, because um, I want to ask a couple more questions for you real quickly, sir. Okay. Is incentives in the state and local pilots and TIFs and opportunity zones, you know, there's been a lot of combat that people think, well, the companies are going to come here. They're going to come here. You don't have to incentivize them. I, I, you know, my personal opinion is, well, if other cities are doing it. You better get in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Do we need to be pushing Nash, the state government, not national, but the state government for better incentives here? Or do we think we have enough tools right now? You know, um, I got the question a lot, uh, particularly when I was in, in Nashville and they were like, what, what, why can't more projects uh, be directed to Memphis, your ECD, you have control over that, right? And the answer to that is it's, it's, uh, it can be further from that, that truth or perceived reality. Uh, these companies, and, and if you know, they're consultant-led, these companies are identifying the markets where they want to go, and then they're capturing information. Um, so they are predefining, in many cases, where they think they want to be. Um, and so that is up to us. We have to redirect and, and control that better ourselves. And we have the opportunity to do that and to work with the state uh, because I do have those pre-existing relationships um, that are very strong and I, I'm uh, already working with them on, on some things. So uh, we have the ability to, to really take uh, control over that and have more project activity come our way because we are speaking with one voice. We're very organized and, and very targeted and focused on, on getting the win. Um, so, you know, the, the incentives, um, I mean, are always a necessity and a reality of this process. And, and I understood, uh, because I fought for the budget every year and presented it to the legislature, uh, who had to decide, is this where we're going to allocate our, our resources? Um, and, and we were able to, uh, communicate the return on investment, the payback period of every project. And we only incentivize projects that were going to enhance the state's economy. And we looked at it from a county perspective. We said, what's a high quality job? The governor ran on that. Well, you have to define it. You have to define it and then make it a reality. And so we settled on each county's median uh, average wage as being defining uh, the definition of a high quality job. So we were only going to incentivize a project that was either at or above that county median wage. Um, so we can be very targeted. We can be very supportive of ECD's request through the budget. And, and then it's up to us to make sure that, that those commitments of incentives are coming to the, our projects because we've positioned them so well and there's no way that Memphis is gonna lose. So, um, you know, all of it is stackable and it needs to be stackable. We always need to be uh, aware and mindful of other resources that we need and bring those to the table if we can. Um, but I, I think, you know, honestly, we have the capability now. We just have to increase the deal flow. Yeah. And I think that I, I, one of the great opportunities and normally we wrap up about 1240. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of shut yeah. it down real, real quickly here so people come back and I'm going to encourage Amy to invite you back after you've gotten your feet wet, maybe after eight months, six months, two weeks, however long you need. Hopefully you don't need any longer than two weeks to get all this done <laughs> so that you can put a little bit more meat on the bone. It, it sounds like there's so mm -hmm. many lanes to focus on. I'm really glad to see you thinking about all the things. I, I, boy, I'm, I'm jotting notes down left and right uh, on everything that you've been saying is that I do think that one of our greatest advantages outside of our water, great water, Outside of the fact that we do have a younger population that is very trainable, uh, I found that we've got a lot of young people working in our office, very trainable. They just need mentoring, coaching, and direction. It's our diversity. And we Absolutely. moved here 
I moved here after the army and, and stuff and, and we're never, nobody's going to get rid of us. Sorry, Beverly. You're not, you're not getting rid of me. Um, is we love the diversity. We love the fact that our daughter, very eclectic mosaic life. And we're starting to see a lot of companies and corporations. How are you going to, are you going to, I bet you're going to leverage that. I bet you got a plan for how to leverage oh, this diversity no, we have. No, no question about it. I, you know, I, I again, go citing the, uh, the protest to progress and the amazing work that the business community has, has supported uh, under Beverly's leadership and, and the team at the chamber is that differentiator. I think the, the yield of that effort, uh, the fact that we focused on it and we were intentional and, and it, it's more than talk, it's, it's action oriented, um, is what I want to incorporate in the message. I mean, it, it's important for me to, to go to that business owner and say, you know, we understand there are a lot of stressors here and you're coming to a community that is uh, majority minority, that is highly diverse, that has, uh, you know, even tragically had to deal with this for decades because of the assassination of Dr. King, right? But now out of that tragedy, we are the home of education on civil rights. We have the National Civil Rights Museum and heck, our leader of this organization was its, its executive and, and made it a world-class destination. So we are uh, unafraid of having the, the difficult conversations with the focus on creating productivity out of it, it's constructive environment changing, exacting change agents in our community so that you benefit from that. You immediately can tap into a diverse workforce based on our population. Um, you know, the University of Memphis, I'll go back to them. Uh, you know, they are the most diverse university in our state. It's the second largest university in our state. And in fact, they're ranked 17th nationally for the number of degrees conferred to African-Americans. So those are things that I, I want to have that, that chance to sit across the table with that CEO and say, if diversity and inclusion is, is part of your, your uh, spirit of your company, what better place to consider than Memphis? We can deliver on that and, and provide an enriching environment for, for decades to come to, to help you realize your growth. And, and Ted, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear you say that. Um, our, my personal company right here, we have a very diverse partnership group, very diverse. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we only benefit from it. I think we only grow, mm -hmm. get to see so many different views. And finally, maybe the rest of the nation is catching up to Memphis um, well, on, on, on being awesome. So Yeah, it, it, it is. I think it is our greatest strength. I think it is because um, it, it shouldn't be a secret weapon. Uh, let's not make it a secret. Let's let's tell it. Let's tell it to the world uh, because it, it is such. It has such rich content, and and it's it's been so constructive for the community. Do we get it right always? Hell no, we don't. But but we have a focus on getting it right and and putting in the hard work to make sure that we do. Um, that's a that's a communication that has has really not been out there. It was never part of a pitch uh, when I was at ECD come look at our diversity. It wasn't, but you know what? The world has changed and, and, uh, and we have been a home to amazing thought leaders in the space, fortunately. And, and I'm blessed to have the president and CEO as one of those. So uh, it will absolutely inform our strategy and be a part of our narrative. Well, Ted, I want to thank you for joining us today. I think we only got a, a toe dip into all the work that you're going to have to do. Uh, you're not alone. We're here for you. Um, it, it's a I big job. And I would say reach out, you know, to, to us, the community, the small businesses. And I know you're already tapping into so many different things, but love yeah. to have you back after you start to push and pull a little bit and, and, yep. and really dig deep. So Amy Daniels. Well, oh, sorry. Let me just say real quick yeah. on that front, Brian, you know, I would love to establish a regular cadence of that. I think it, this, this information and communication flow is absolutely critical for all of us to succeed. So you have my commitment. I'm here to serve. And yes, we're going to be focused on bringing in new business and helping businesses expand. But um, please know that, that we want all of your input. Yeah, great. Be a part I, of this team. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, and I really appreciate the work that the, the, the 
senior leaders with Beverly's uh, direction went to really focus on economic development, which is all about jobs and growing everyone's prosperity in this entire region. So Amy Daniels will be forwarding an email out about our next show. I don't know what it is right now. So if you've got any ideas of shows you'd like to see or speakers you'd like to hear us kind of break it through, please send them to Amy Daniels and we'll make sure that that next Lunch in the Know happens. And so we hope you enjoyed it. I got a ton of notes right here. So I hope you got some out of it and we'll be asking you to, to jump in with us and keep creating and building jobs right here in Memphis, Tennessee. And of course, beating Nashville. Thanks everybody. Go Memphis. Go Memphis. Thanks. <laughs>